Welcome to lecture 11, uh, the uh, second from last lecture of this course. Um, it will be about COVID-19. First, a few practical issues. Uh, the deadline for home assignment one has passed. I think uh, uh, most of you have turned it in. I think we received 45 uh, turned in assignments or similar. Uh, you should get those back. Uh, sometime uh, within one week from now it has been slightly delayed but within one week i hope uh, and uh, uh, home assignment two is now available on the course page since a week ago uh, and the deadline for that is august 25 however i strongly encourage you to turn it in as in the instructions already uh, by August 14. Uh, in that way, you will get peer review from uh, colleague, stu uh, colleague students if you also give peer reviews to other students. So the idea is that three people will read your home assignments and give constructive uh, uh, criticism uh, and hopefully with that you will be able to improve your home assignments before turning it in August 25. Uh, in order to do so you also have to uh, give feedback to three other home assignments in a constructive way. More about that is written in the in home assignment two instructions. Uh, and the final examination is a written exam, exam, uh, and it happens August 28th, which is a Friday. And you must register uh, for this, uh, to take part in this um, written exam. And the deadline to register is one week earlier, so August 21. Um, Earlier today, I put up some instructions and rules for this written exam, so that can be found on the course webpage. In short, you will be able to uh, download the written exam at nine o'clock that day, and you should upload your solutions uh, by 2 p.m. the same day. Uh, but see the instructions for that. Okay, so let me start with uh, lecture 11 and then let me put on share screen. So as I said, this lecture is about uh, COVID-19 and in particular it is quite a lot about work that I have done in the area. Uh, not that maybe that is the most important thing but anyway I'm of course a little bit interested in that and I think it's a fairly simple idea so in that sense uh, possible to explain in this course at a very low technical level. Uh, here, before I do that I will give some uh, uh, stuff before that uh, and I think one or two of the slides before the new work will have appeared earlier among that among others I think this slide or part of this slide has been shown earlier anyway uh, I think it's a, a nice way to write the basic reproduction number which if you remember in the homogeneous case is the average number of infectious contacts that one infected person has because it's one any infected person has because in homogeneous case everyone behaves similarly and you can think of this as a product of three quantities p which is the transmission probability k which is the rate at which you meet others and L, which is du the duration of the infectious period. So if you want to think of prevention, uh, so suppose you put in some preventive measures and uh, you do this very early in the epidemic with the effect that this product, which equals R naught, is reduced by a factor C. 
if c varies with time, you should have instead have it c of t. But let's for now consider that it is fixed all through the epidemic. If that happens, you get the new effective, you get the new reproduction number, which is sometimes called the effective reproduction number. And we start off by considering the homogeneous case. So the effective reproduction number in the homogeneous case is the original basic reproduction number multiplied by one minus c. But so the the part of the uh, or the not uh, the part that is not reduced by preventive measures. So c is the overall factor reducing the contacts. So one minus c is the remaining contacts, and the effective reproduction number is or not multiplied by one minus c. And of course, uh, for the same reason as uh, I talked about earlier, there will be no outbreak. If this is done early on, there will be no outbreak if this basic reproduction number is below one. So if this thing is below one, there will be no outbreak. And that is equivalent to saying that the, the, the re reduction factor C must be as leads at least one minus one upon R naught. However, if that is not the case, then the epidemic will uh, grow uh, because uh, at least if it has already started, it will continue to grow perhaps at a slower rate if there is a reduction. Uh, but as, this, uh, as it grows, immunity will start building up. I think this is for instance what what happened in Sweden when we changed our preventive measures around mid-March. I think the effect was that the reproduction number was still above one, but immunity was built up slowly. Um, and only infectious contacts with, no, with people that are not yet infected will result in infection. So after some time, this initial effective reproduction number will be reduced in the sense that we now have to multiply by a third factor, which is the fraction that are susceptible. And in the homogeneous case, you meet the, anyone with equal probability, so it's simply the, the overall fraction of susceptibles. So if if the initial effective reproduction number is above one, then eventually the effective reproduction number, or sorry, it will start, it will be above one when you start, but it will decay because these two terms remain constant, whereas fraction susceptible decays. So Re of t will decay. And for t large enough, it will decay below the value one. And then when this happens, the epidemic starts declining and it will soon thereafter stop. So um, for instance, I think this is the case in um, nearly all uh, countries in Europe currently, that the current effective reproduction number is below one in more or less all countries in Europe but not in US, for instance. So it's a delicate choice of wording, effective reproduction number. Uh, some people call the effective reproduction number the original one and only taking uh, the preventive measures in account, whereas others use it for, uh, just like this. It contains the basic reproduction number, the effect of uh, prevention and the effect of uh, immunity. Uh, some people call the later thing, uh, the current or the daily reproduction number, if they also take into account uh, the immunity in the, in the population. So be aware if you hear the effective reproduction number, what is meant. So that was for the homogeneous case. For the heterogeneous case, it is much more complicated and we will not solve this because, uh, well, it depends on what type of model you believe is true, but uh, I think in general it is very complicated. So here is just a sketch. So let's script I of T represent 
the composition of individuals that get infected around the time t. So this is not rigorous math, but a bit uh, heuristics. So I, script I of t sort of represents the, the type or the group of people that get infected around some time t. Then in the heterogeneous situation, the effective reproduction number at time t uh, and assuming that uh, prevention is such that all types of individual reduce the spreading by the same factor c then the current or daily or effective reproduction number equals the reproduction number, the original or not, not the original, but the basic reproduction number for the group of people that currently are getting infected, multiplied by the effect of the preventive measures, which might vary with T, multiplied by the fraction of susceptibles among those people that this group uh, have contact with. So the difference from the previous slide is that we should count how many on average do people infect, how many on average would people that are infected now infect without preventive measures, multiplied by the effect of the preventive measures, multiplied by the fraction of susceptibles among those people that are contacted by this group the group of currently infectious people. So R is R I T is the average number of infectious contacts before prevention. The preventive measures are called uh, the effect of that is called C of T and it's assumed to be the same for all groups of individuals. And finally the immunity or one minus the immunity is S I of T. That's the fraction of still susceptible among individuals contacted by the, the, the inf currently infectious group. So we would like to know what is this value? And then we make uh, an approximation, which I don't know if it's crude or fairly uh, uh, reasonable to make and that is assuming that the group of people that are infected by the currently infected just people the fraction of them that are susceptible is about the same as the overall fraction of people that are susceptible if that is the case the, uh, the current or uh, effective reproduction number equals uh, the effect of the Preventive measures, here I remove T, assuming that it's constant, times the overall fraction susceptible, multiplied by the average number of contacts among this currently infectious group without preventive measures. And an important uh, property, or I would say more or less a fact, is that this quantity, R0 of I of T, how many among the group of currently infectious how many uh, would they infect on average if everyone was susceptible this quantity it is very reasonable to assume that this quantity decays with t so why is that well the main reason is that in the beginning those that get infected are typically more socially active so they would infect more people than people that than among uh, people that get infected later who are less socially active. So this means that fewer people will get infected in the heterogeneous case as compared to in the, a homogeneous situation if you start with the same uh, initial basic reproduction number. This is true or with or without preventive measures. So here's an illustration of this. The blue curve is the fraction infectious for a homogeneous situation and, and the red curve is the fraction of infectious 
people uh, in a heterogeneous situation where the two models are calibrated by both having the same basic reproduction number and both having the same initial growth rate this uh, uh, yeah generation time distribution i think if i remember correctly i think this model was for a situation where half of the community are more susceptible and the other uh, community are less susceptible half are more susceptible and half are less susceptible so we see that over time the peak is much is clearly higher for the homogeneous situation and also the final size in the homogeneous case is bigger than that of the heterogeneous model. So to continue and uh, what what I already said earlier is that when the current effective reproduction number is below one then the epidemic will decline and soon thereafter it will die out so this means that those that are not yet infected by then or soon thereafter will be protected so this means that given the effect of the current preventive measures which we call c and given the epidemic up until now this would imply that there is sufficient immunity for the epidemic to die out and hence soon protecting the remaining susceptibles. So whenever this happens, it means that we have currently, we have sufficient immunity uh, given the current preventive measures such that the disease will decline and die out. How about herd immunity? What does that mean? Well, that refers to the situation when there are when there are no preventive measures. So if you set C equals zero, if you still have R E of T below one, then you have what is called herd immunity. So the question you might ask is that are are we safe if we go back to normality? Uh, by this is meant that we said C equals zero. Are we safe? Will uh, RE still be below one? If the answer is yes, then you have herd immunity. If the answer is no, you don't have herd immunity. Related question to this is how much back towards normality can we go and still have the effective reproduction number below one? This is a question that is very uh, topical question right now that is what many scientists uh, wonder in different parts of the world because at least in europe now the current uh, the effective reproduction number is below one so then the question is what steps back towards normality can we take and still have the effective reproduction number below one Uh, so let me say a few words about classical herd immunity. And classical herd immunity was defined for vaccination. So the classical question was then, what fraction age needs to be immunized by means of vaccination in advance in order to avoid an outbreak um, when there are no preventive measures? The answer to that is um, that will depend on how you vaccinate. But the answer, if you vaccinate uniformly, which is the, the, the most common situation, this is known since long back, it says that if you vaccinate such that the original basic reproduction number multiplied by the fraction that is not vaccinated, if that number is below one, then you will have no outbreak. So this is equivalent to saying that the fraction vaccinated needs to be at least one minus one upon R naught. This is true not only for the homogeneous case, but uh, for a very wide class of epidemic models. 
uh, if you assume that you vaccinate individuals uniformly. So the critical vaccination coverage is one minus one upon R naught. If you vaccinate differently, the answer is different. For instance, uh, if you vaccinate in an optimal may, way, uh, you would have to uh, vaccinate fewer in order to obtain herd immunity. And what, exactly what fraction? Well, that depends on the underlying model. And the classical illustration is uh, what's called the heavy tail network epidemic model. And the first to uh, discover this was uh, Pastor Zatora and Vespignani uh, close to 20 years ago. And they considered a network which is scale free, meaning that it has a very high, var uh, high variance or even infinite variance uh, for the degree distribution. Then, uh, in that case, the critical vaccination coverage, if you do uniform vaccination, would be close to 100%, whereas if you vaccinate uh, uh, optimally, and what would optimally be? Well, you would vaccinate individuals with high degrees, then it could be that you don't have to vaccinate uh, more than 1%. So a huge difference depending on if you vaccinate uniformly or if you vaccinate optimally. Uh, how about disease-induced herd immunity? That is a different thing. Uh, and it has not been addressed earlier because this is the first time in, uh, at least in the modern times, where uh, an, a disease outbreak, uh, an epidemic outbreak has been sort of stopped, or at least currently stopped by means of people changing their behavior. Uh, so then, in this situation, it, uh, herd immunity uh, connects to the following question. How many must have been infected during a mitigated outbreak in order to avoid a second epidemic outbreak once all preventive measures are lifted? So for instance, now in Sweden, suppose we go back to complete normality today. Uh, would, is there risk for a second outbreak? If the answer is yes, it means that we don't have uh, herd immunity. If the answer is no, it means that we would have herd immunity. I would think that the answer is uh, uh, that there is risk for an outbreak if we go back to complete normality now. So that is something we have addressed in, in the paper which was published in Science. And the scientific scenario is the following. So we consider the COVID-19 outbreak in a country where you have mitigation or possibly lockdown and, and you gradually exit towards normality. Then the question is, when will herd immunity be reached? So you have mitigation and lockdown, meaning that more and more people get uh, infected gradually. So immunity builds up. And then the question is, what immunity is necessary before uh, herd immunity will be reached? Uh, and uh, assuming that we know what R0 is. Is the answer, is the, answer uh, the same as for the classical uh, vaccination immunity levels? One, so one minus one upon R0, which is 60% if R0 is 2.5. The answer is yes, if your immunization is distributed uniformly, as it is for vaccination, but, the, but that answer is not correct when immunity is achieved from disease spreading. So why is that? Uh, or before why, uh, let me say what the answer is. And then the answer is that disease-induced herd immunity will occur at a sub substantially lower level than classical herd immunity level. So the classical herd immunity level when R0 was 2.5 was 60%, whereas the disease-induced herd immunity level is perhaps uh, around 40 to 45% uh, rather than 60%. So this is something we illustrated in a model, uh, which I will talk about now. But uh, at, at 
the same time, uh, another uh, group of scientists showed for a, a rather different model. Uh, they showed that the level could be as low as 10 to 20 percent. Uh, I don't know what's true. I think this is closer to reality than this one, but we, we don't claim that this is uh, completely true. Or we don't know if it's completely true. So what is the heuristic explanation to why the disease-induced herd immunity level is lower than the vaccine-induced herd immunity? Well, because in vaccination programs, you select vaccines randomly, or at least you don't know how people, which people choose to vaccinate and which don't, so you treat them as uniformly selected. However, uh, during a disease outbreak, immunization is not distributed uniformly. Highly active uh, and social individuals are more likely to be infected, as are people with higher susceptibility. So this means that the immunity somehow is more efficiently distributed in the community in the sense that those potential spreaders are more likely to be immune than um, people staying at home. It is not done in a perfect way, so the optimal vaccination strategy is even more effective, but uh, immunity, uh, disease-induced immunity is at least more efficiently distributed than random, than uniformly distributed. And this has been well known for a long time uh, and discussed in many papers, but, but typically without uh, reject, uh, mitigation without any preventive measures put in place. So after a big outbreak, it is known that people that have been infected are um, groups with high social activity are overrepresented. However, uh, what no one seemed to have uh, uh, realized uh, earlier was that uh, this sort of effective, efficient distribution of immunity uh, will come uh, will be sort of useful when we have mitigation or suppression. Uh, and this we have illustrated with a rather specific model, not claiming to be the exact model, but at least capturing some type of features. But before I talk about that, let me uh, take a short break. So I will stop here.